Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I look forward to giving you a brief presentation of the main findings of the assessment that uh, we have carried out in, in the European Commission of the implementation of the Water Framework Directive. Uh, the, what you will see here is an analysis of the information as it is provided by the Member States with all the possible defaults that there can be in, in that information. Uh, the information has been published as part of the blueprint package uh, and consists firstly of a communication uh, with a report on the assessment of the river basin management plans. This is a relatively short document of 15 pages and is available in all official EU languages. Uh, Following this, there's a much more comprehensive Commission staff working document which contains a comparative analysis and recommendations uh, at the level of the EU. It's two volumes, uh, totaling about 250 pages. And then we have, uh, in addition to this, for each member state, plus Norway, a, um, a separate document uh, containing the assessment of the river basin management plans reported by that particular uh, country and with recommendations by country. These documents are available in English and in the relevant national language or languages uh, for the country concerned. This map shows the status of adoption of uh, plans under the Water Framework Directive. The plans were due at the end of 2009. As of today, uh, the green countries represent uh, the countries that have uh, adopted and reported their river basin management plans, and the red countries are countries uh, which have not yet uh, fully reported their river basin management plans. These are Belgium, uh, where I think we miss two out of three plans. Uh, we have Portugal, uh, where we have no record of any reported plans, although we have been told by the Portuguese authorities uh, a couple of days ago that they think they have reported some of the plans. Uh, there's Spain, which uh, I think has reported one plan. Uh, and Greece, uh, which has not yet reported any plans. General findings uh, about the river basin management plan. Well, there are a lot of positives that you can see on the uh, left-hand side of this slide. It's very clear that a lot of effort has been put into the preparation of the plans, uh, and there has been an impressive knowledge improvement in the last uh, 10, 12 years or so since 2000 when the directive uh, was adopted. There's also, as a positive thing, been a high uptake of the common framework which is established under the directive. Um, there has been an integration of an ecological perspective into water management in the past before the water framework directive. It was to a large extent about chemical water quality. Uh, there has been an enhancement of international cooperation in uh, transboundary <laughs> waters, that's very clear. Uh, this, the Water Framework Directive has meant a boost to transboundary cooperation on a number of major and minor international rivers. Um, public participation uh, has increased a lot and I think the, the breadth of the uh, of, of the assembly here today, I think witnesses uh, to this stakeholder involvement has become uh, routine in, in water management in Europe. On the less good side, as I already said, there are four member states who are lagging behind uh, with respect to their plans. There's also low ambition in many of the plans. I would go as far as to say that even in some member states, uh, one gets the feeling that it is business as usual that has been dressed up uh, as implementation of the Water Framework Directive. Uh, measures, measures to address water quality problems have not been sufficiently defined everywhere. 
there's lack of comparability of information, for example, on chemical status. We will come back to this. Uh, and uh, there's still a problem in aligning uh, water management uh, or decisions in, with implications for water management with environmental protection needs. This is about cross-sectoral integration with agriculture, <laughs> with energy, uh, with transport, and so on. And it's about definition of exemptions. Uh, there are many exemptions that have been applied, which is a cause for concern. Uh, and finally, and last and but not least, uh, insufficient consideration of water pricing and uh, definition of costs and, and, and benefits. These are areas where improvement is still needed. Where will the Water Framework Directive bring us? Well, you will see these figures here on the left-hand side. You see uh, the uh, expected results of the river basin management plans as reported uh, by the member states. The green and the blue uh, are what co corresponds to so-called good status and high status, which are uh, classifications which are in compliance with the objectives of the directive, the main objectives, while the yellow the orange and the red uh, fall short of uh, attaining the, the, the general objective of the directive. You can see here that there's good news and there's bad news. Uh, the good news is that there are quite a lot of waters in good status, almost half the waters uh, that you see here are in good or high status, uh, but the cup is not only half full, it is also half empty. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, scope uh, for improvement here. On the right hand side um, you see this is the chemical status of, of the waters uh, and there you see a lot of grey areas. Now the grey is a cause for concern here. Uh, the grey uh, means that there's no information allowing to classify uh, whether we will arrive at good status or, or, or bad status. So here there's an information gap, uh, there's some homework which has either not been done or not been reported uh, to the Commission about classifying uh, the chemical status of, of, of these waters. Of the waters where we have information, uh, we can see it goes in the good direction, there's more blue than there's red. A lot has been achieved, as it says here, uh, but challenges remain. Some of the challenges or some of the significant pressures that we see here, the most significant pressures are so-called hydromorphological pressures, which are physical modifications of water bodies, uh, which have been uh, addressed very little in the first set of river basin management plans, and it is diffuse sources of pollution, including notably uh, agricultural sources uh, of pollution. These are issues which will need a lot of further work. Uh, the impacts that are had here, diffuse sources typically has impact on nutrient enrichment uh, and on contamination with uh, chemical substances. The hydromorphological uh, pressures typically have uh, impacts on the habitats. If you turn a river into a canal, uh, you will end up losing uh, a lot of habitats and at the end of the day, a lot of species and biodiversity. We have also looked, uh, although not in the river basin management plan analysis, we have looked at the policy of water, scarc and water scarcity and droughts and its implementation. We have uh, tried to give a, di a diagnosis of the size of the problem uh, today, we have found that there's water stress in 26 basins in Europe all year round and 43 basins in the summer, so-called seasonal water scarcity. This is out of uh, maybe 100, between 100 and 200 uh, basins overall. The bad news is that the projection is that for 2030, the permanent water stress will increase uh, from 26 to 47 bases and the seasonal water stress will increase from 43 to 63 basins. 
Um, and for those who believe that this is only an issue in the Mediterranean, the, I'm afraid there's also bad news because of the 63 basins with seasonal water scarcity, 31 uh, are expected to be in the north. And when I say the north, it's mainly north of the Pyrenees and north of the Alps. So what is being done about this? What is being done about water scarcity and droughts? We identified seven priorities in the 2007 communication on water scarcity and droughts. Some of these have been implemented more or less, but uh, the efforts are insufficient to revert the trend and climate change may exacerbate the effect. So therefore, this is an issue that unfortunately will remain on the agenda. The, with respect to the river basin management plans and quantity issues, there's little uh, availability in the plans about water demand and availability. Demand is only addressed in 35% of the river basin management plans. Availability of water in even less than 25%. There's also little uh, information on any kind of quantitative analysis and there's a very limited harmonization of measures in this area with uh, other kinds of planning, that is the sectoral uh, and the territorial uh, planning. Here, some information about uh, ecological uh, status of surface water bodies that we have found. It shows that uh, there is no one-size-fits-all. Commissioner Potocnik mentioned there, was no, there were no one-size-fits-all uh, solutions. There are no one-size-fits-all problems either. Um, the blue bars show the starting point as reported by member states and we can see that there are some member states which had already at the outset of the planning exercise a very high degree of uh, good status, some with a very low degree. Uh, the gray areas, uh, the gray bars represent uh, knowledge gaps where we do not know, that is where status is unknown. And also with respect to application of exemptions, uh, which are the red bars, the length of the red bars uh, indicate the degree to which exemptions have been applied and we can see a very varied picture here. Now exemptions should be the exception and not the rule and therefore there's very clearly uh, a cause for concern here. I mean there are many exemptions uh, and we would certainly want to see in the next set of river basin management plans many fewer exemptions. Chemical status of surface water, slightly different picture. Uh, let's say, generally speaking, there's uh, uh, reported a, a better status than for surface water. There are fewer exemptions. There's one which is all red, which is to do with a particular pollutant. One of the big concerns here is the huge gray area here. There's much more gray area here than we saw for surface uh, water. So. There's simply, again, an issue of things that have either not been measured or not reported uh, to the Commission. Here we have some numbers showing the progress. I think you could focus perhaps on the right-hand column, the progress uh, in percentage of water bodies achieving the main objective of the directive, ecological status of surface waters from 40 to 50 percent more or less, 10 percent increase. Uh, and do I need to say that it is a concern that if we continue at this rate, it will take, uh, it will take another five river basin management plans before we get close to the, the target? I think there's a, a lot of homework to do here. Um, on Ground water, well, on chemical status of surface waters, we hadn't reported anything because of the information gap that I already told you about. On quantitative status of groundwater, we are doing much better. The starting point was much better. Uh, there's still a gap of 4% uh, to, to, to be made, but we need to be vigilant that we continue to protect uh, our uh, groundwaters. That was the quantitative status and the chemical status. We are at 90% and we are moving uh, ahead at a rate of 6%. So, well, if we can continue good efforts in this area, uh, I'm sure we will be able to get there. 
a few words about concerns, about milestones for achieving the directives. Um, this is a figure which shows the number of international river basin districts where there are transboundary surface water monitoring programs in place. So this is basically about transboundary uh, cooperation. Now, the first thing you will see is the top of these bars, it says not relevant. And, uh, you know, one can ask oneself the question, why is it not relevant to know about or to have transboundary monitoring in transboundary rivers? Well, I ask myself that question as well, but as I said initially, this is information reported by the member states, and we will have the question to the member states who think this is not relevant, why is this not relevant? Uh, there's also quite a large, these are the purple parts of the bars, where there's no information reported. The green bars is where there's no transboundary monitoring program, uh, and only in, in the blue bars in the bottom uh, is there uh, in the whole river ba basin district transboundary monitoring. So there's still progress uh, to be made in this area. Another area of concern is the designation of so-called heavily modified water bodies. These are water bodies where the physical structure of the water bodies uh, has been changed, for example, through dams, through uh, embankments through uh, significant uh, abstractions which have significantly lowered the flow in, in, in the water body or the amount of water in it. Uh, this is supposed to be, so we say, a scientific uh, exercise based on objective methods uh, and it is a cause for concern. The designation has mainly at this stage been based on expert judgment and we hope this will improve. Um, there's also a requirement, this is not designating a water body, as this is not something uh, you can choose like uh, a product in the supermarket. There are certain criteria that need to be fulfilled uh, and there's a deficit on the assessment of, of these criteria and this is also an area which needs to improve. Uh, then it says on the slide, progress in translating ecological potential into biological targets. That is because ecological potential rather than ecological status is the target that needs to be applied uh, for this kind of water bodies and which will take account of the modifications. And then there are only a few uh, approaches developed for quantifying biological targets uh, as part of environmental potential. Exemptions. Um, these figures, for those who are interested in numbers, I say right away that these are not directly compatible with the rainbows that I showed before, because these include, while those I showed before only included surface water bodies, which are not heavily modified water bodies, these figures here include heavily modified water bodies. But you can see there's a very significant application of exemptions to surface waters. I think this is the main concern that comes out of this. And of course, when you apply to a very large number of water bodies, you can question whether you are attaining the general objective of the directive, which is to achieve good status. So this is our uh, main concern here. Um, there's also an issue of justification. There are very clear requirements in the Water Framework Directive about uh, the kind of criteria uh, that need to be satisfied before you can apply, apply exemptions. These are linked to technical infeasibility, to disproportionate costs, uh, and so on. And the justification uh, of application of exemptions is untransparent in many plans and needs to be improved. And this, of course, adds to the level of concern about uh, application of exemptions, that these have been applied to a very large extent and in an untransparent manner. Yeah, and now, well, we try. Yes. Uh, there's a special exemptions paragraph on so-called new physical modifications uh, of water bodies. It's called Article 4.7. This is a particular uh, cause for concern because uh, we are, do not see 
that it has been applied in uh, many river basin management plans. Now, the benign interpretation of this would be that there's probably no need. There will be no physical modifications. There will be no new dams. There will be no new embankments. Uh, and, and, and so on, but we do not believe that this is the case, and in fact we have in many cases evidence that things are going on which should have been uh, assessed uh, under this. We know this through, for example, the information we get on uh, use of regional funding. Uh, so we think that there's a lot of scope for improvement here. The requirements in this respect have clearly not been followed. Uh, and the assessments uh, not been carried out. General conclusions, well, again, there's uh, some good news, there's some bad news. There is uh, an impressive improvement in the knowledge of water status in the EU. There's increased and improved transparency in setting objectives and managing water, in spite of what I've said about some of the things. Uh, the ecological perspective has clearly now entered into uh, EU water management. This has been, become part of uh, daily business, which I think is very good news. Um, however, there are areas, uh, as mentioned and identified uh, in the blueprint, where additional guidance uh, may be needed monitoring, chemical status, costs and benefits, hydromorphology, exemptions, and, and so on. Uh, and the assessment shows that there's a need, certainly, to improve performance here, determined effort to try and achieve uh, the WFD objectives in the 2015 time frame already, the next set of river basin management plans, which are due in three years' time, and, of course, in the following river basin management plans. There's a need for better definition uh, of measures in the uh, programs of measures. Uh, but, it, of course, in order to do this, in order to define them, in order to understand them, and in order to justify them in particular, uh, there's a need for a better understanding of costs of inaction and benefits uh, of measures. And there's a need for a consistent framework uh, at EU level so that we can apply this uh, in a consistent manner also in transboundary basins. Um, we need good implementation. We need a very uh, consistent uh, planning uh, process with uh, good implementation of measures. We need integration uh, EU-wide, uh, national and basin scale tools that we can apply, and we need to improve the quality of reporting, and I would say, go so far as also to say that we need to get away from the idea that reporting uh, is, is, is a burden. We need to look at information and data as a question of sharing uh, this kind of information, which is useful uh, to all, to stakeholders, uh, to the Commission, to, to member states, and making sure that we have the data that we need and the information we need. How will we follow this up? Well, we will be aiming at ensuring correct implementation uh, in the first and second river basin management plan periods. We will follow up bilaterally with each member state on the basis of the uh, national reports that we have made. Uh, we will of course, use enforcement where enforcement is the uh, obvious answer. Uh, but we will also, uh, as proposed in the blueprint, privilege the use of the common implementation strategy uh, where in all areas where that strategy can be useful in helping us move towards uh, better delivery uh, of the objectives of, of water policy. And, of course, finally, we have looked also at new legislative measures to a lesser degree. Um, we will assess. We are now going into an assessment of the programs of measures. There's a requirement for member states to report this uh, very shortly. Uh, and the next step for, for the Commission will be assessment of the programs of measures. 
uh, it will be integration of the different uh, EU water directives and we will assess the programs of measures in terms of their ability to deliver the objectives uh, that are set out in the river basin management plans. Reactions to the blueprint, well, as uh, the President of the Council has already said, there uh, will be Council conclusions, most likely in December, uh, and we look forward to that. And of course, the European Parliament remains to be seen. The blueprint package here, we've summarized what are the documents. The presentation is available so that you can uh, check whether you have all the documents that, that you want. And I thank you for your attention and uh, put, draw your attention to the fact that the, all the documents uh, that I have mentioned are available on this uh, web address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for the very interesting uh, presentation and all the information given. We must admit that uh, progress ha has been made, definitely, but uh, there is still a lot of work to be done. But just a thought, why am I not surprised that very little progress has been made by member states on water pricing? I wonder. Uh, we will now have a 10-minute uh, discussion. Firstly, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Federico Ramos, Secretary of State for the Environment of the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Environment of Spain, and later on to Mr. Peter Kovac, uh, Deputy State Secretary, Ministry of Rural Development in ha Hungary. Mr. Ramos, you have the floor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank the Commission and the EU Presidency for convening this conference. It gives us an excellent opportunity to jointly assess the discuss the blueprint recommendation prepared by the Commission. This is an urgent and unavoidable debate. Secondly, I would like to congratulate the European Commission for its excellent work and very useful work. Further progress in the implementation of the EU water policy is needed. Of course, we share the assessment of the European Commission. A lot is to be done yet. Before assessing how we can make better progress, it would be worth it to analyze why we have fallen short so far and why, if we follow the current path, we will face a well, directive. Some ideas should be taken into account in this regard. Some questions must be answered as a preliminary basis for this debate. First, we wonder if the original goals and expectations set in the EU Water Framework Directive and water-related policies were in line with the respective capabilities of the different EU member states. We might want to think twice if the level of ambition pursued years ago was realistic or not, and if it is still valid. Second, no one size fits all. The challenges you member states face when implementing the EU water legislation vary dramatically depending on their social, geographical, cultural and economic reality. This is particularly relevant for the south of Europe where the chronic water scarcity has been exacerbated by negative impacts of climate change and where, in addition, current financial crisis has hampered the ability of governments to undertake the construction of infrastructures required to fulfill the obligation laid down in the EU legislation. In order to better implement of the EU water, fr um, uh, water framework directive in future, enough flexibility must be given to the EU member states when choosing among the blueprint recommendation do those which better fit the reality of each country, of each river basin district. 
Very much along the lines of the EU, EU, European Union Commission, Spain has identified three tools that can foster the ability of the EU partners to make real and concrete progress in the attainment of the EU water goals. More investment in research and development, better financial and water pricing policies, and lastly, deeper integration of water policies into European Union sectorial policies. First, technology and resource efficiency. Current water technology development must be further upgraded to enhance the implementation ability of the European Union member states. It is, in addition, a precondition for the European Union to transit, to transit towards a green, a green growth strategy. Without resource efficiency, there won't be green economy in Europe, and without further investment in water-related technologies, there won't be resource efficiency in water management. This is the reason why, in the context of the European Union strategy for 2020 and the, our common efforts to build an efficient Europe in water resource use, a special attention must be given to technological needs in the field of water. The European Innovation Partnership are a remarkable step in the good direction, but it's not enough. Establishing a European Union line to financially support investments in water research and development should be explored in order to support EU member states' effort to implement the EU water legislation and policies. Second, integration. Integration is needed, no doubt about it. The relevant question is how. Let's be careful. This is not the first time we address this exercise. Two cautions must be borne in mind to avoid past mistakes. First, every single European Union public policy, from transport to agriculture, from climate change to environment, has its own fora. The legitimacy of this fora must be preserved and respect. Conditionalities, requirements, impositions coming from the EU Environment Council must be misunderstood and rejected. Cooperation, a spirit of compromise, synergetic approaches can be alternative ways to pushing forward EU water-related goals into other EU Council configurations. Besides complexity and plurality of interests held by a huge array of stakeholders are to be duly taken in consideration when incorporating water-related concerns into other EU public policies. Time and consensus are indispensable. Therefore, an step-by-step -step approach is highly recommendable in this matter. Uh, uh, third, financing. Water pricing and tariffs has been given a special attention in the blueprint document as a key tool to advance implementation of the EU water legislation. Adequate funding is also needed to properly enforce EU water-related policies. Spain is following this two-track approach in water pricing to fully reflect the cost recovery of water, as well to attract private, private instruments and in a time of hard public budgetary constraints. An EU support to meet the technological needs in the fields of water can foster greater engagement of private sector in the provision of all water-related services. Nevertheless, caution must be held when it comes to the definition of water pricing policies. It is a very sensitive issue from a political point of view. To succeed in its implementation, these policies must be a strongly science-based support. All necessary economic and technical researches must be carried out before making concrete proposals. In addition, consensus must be achieved with different stakeholders to ensure a non-controversial non and efficient implementation of those policies. Therefore, again, a step-by-step -step approach is highly recommendable. And finally, internationalization. I would like to finish by recalling our commitments outside the EU. At the Rio Plus 20 conference, we reaffirm our commitment regarding to human right to safe drinking water and sanitation. We also have committed to engaging in the post-2015 MDGs agenda review. Water is a crucial component in this agenda. The EU cannot look aside. 
there is an ethical obliga obligation for the EU to assist developing countries, uh, developing countries to meet all MDGs and, in particular, water-related goals. Let's keep this in mind and take advantage of our knowledge, our experience and our technology to help the weakest in the world to get out of their poverty. And at the same time, let's benefit from our internal experience and implementing EU, implementing EU water policies to support EU industry to enter other profitable markets and to export EU highly competitive water-related goods and services. We are already doing it. We can do it together <coughs> to reach farther. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Federico. Mr. Kovac, you have the floor now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to also congratulate to all of you who has participated in the blueprint process for the excellent work. We are convinced that all of the activities, including fitness and compliance checking, and also the relevant ongoing project under this umbrella, will serve as a good basis for, to designate the main policy directions for the future and make the EU water policy and legislation even more effective as today. Please let me remind you that one of the main objectives of the Hungarian presidency was also the contribution to the blueprint process, especially highlighting the importance of the integration of the most important water management aspects into all relevant EU policies. In our opinion, in the frame of the integration process, better implementation of the existing legislation, further efforts and new ambitious steps are similarly necessary, mainly on those areas, such as water governments, and the use of economical tools, for example, into the common agricultural policy, research and innovation policy, enlargement and neighborhood policies. From this point of view, the integration aspects ensuring coherence between the EU strategic documents and information exchange of, less, of best practices have outstanding importance. Of course, The special interest of sectoral and local experts have to be taken into account as well. The international water cooperation is also a strategic need as the most important environmental issues have global dimensions and most of the European river basins are shared by several countries. It means that further strengthening of the international cooperation and global partnership has priority not only on member states level but also on the European level. In our opinion, more attention should be paid in the future for the importance of the role of ecological services of water and wetland areas, taking into account of their human, environmental, economical and international relevances as well. In connection to it, EU level, guide, EU level guidance or technical methodology should be elaborated with the aim to numerate the value of these services, including the cost of their maintenance, instead of legal tools, additional legal tools. By the end of my short intervention, please let me allow to inform you that just after a short time finishing the Rio Plus 20 conference, Hungary is willing to organize a global conference in next atom, probably in October, to define the so-called uh, SDGs goes retailing the water and sanitation field. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Peter. Because we are behind schedule, I'll give the floor just to Mr. P Fritz Hortworth for his very short intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to use the presence of the Commissioner to uh, 
make a few comments because I think uh, this is quite necessary. I, I think we had major achievements, there is a lot of progress, there is, uh, I don't like to, to, uh, to focus on the, on the positive side, but there, is, there are two or three things where I think there is inherent in what we are doing a kind of deficit, and this is the issue of integration. And um, I, frankly speaking, I think um, if integration is not going to work on the EU level, you cannot leave this issue simply to the member state level. I think we are struggling on the member state level with incentives coming from, for example, the agricultural policy, for the renewable energy policy, and from other policies where we are not able to really compensate what's going on in case of wrong incentives through the water policy. This is, this is a debate which is lasting for a long time, but I think uh, if you measure strongly the implementation of EU water legislation, there is no way out to make also clear that there is a limitation when we implement this policy because of the lack of integration we have. And uh, I, really, I really see we are struggling on the national level, you are struggling on the, on the EU level, but uh, I think we have to be careful when we are talking about uh, deficits in implementation. Let me gi give one example. <coughs> Even if we would implement the nitrates directive fully in the Union, we would not be able to reach the goals in the nitrates directive because there are contra counterproductive uh, things we, we cannot really influence. I think this is the only thing where I think that the European Commission leaves member states uh, on its own and uh, does not really help uh, the integration uh, issue. And uh, this is, I think, from my point of view, one of the major deficits uh, we, have, uh, we have to face. And this is not a one-way street uh, to put uh, water issues into agricultural policy. It goes also the other way around and vice versa. All what we are doing is really positive. We changed a lot on the ground. Without the Water Framework Directive, a lot of things would not uh, have happened. But in this case, I think, you have to see that member states on its own are not able to compensate what's going wrong in, wrong in this field. As short as possible, yes. Uh, just just <clears throat> two, three comments of what I have heard. Basically, to be honest, when I was listening to Peter and uh, I, I haven't listened to comprehensive presentation of the blueprint yet, so this was for me also quite an enlightened uh, event. It's worse than I would have hoped. Uh, that's my conclusion. But um, whatever. I think that pointing of uh, all of you who reacted afterwards and also uh, the reaction which you have done, uh, it's the right one. But uh, I think that, that we would s need to start to be a bit more fundamentally honest in our policy making than we are. And that's our real problem. So when you say integration, what actually you are saying? You are saying, please, can you who are responsible for other policies take a bit into consideration also the interests which I cannot fulfill via my own direct policy? That's what we are saying. And sometimes it's really difficult, but uh, I'm pretty much aware of what you are saying, and I'm doing really everything possible on EU level that I would break some of the walls which are existing. Eight, eight years and a half, even more, I'm now in the Commission. I'm hearing from the very first second 
that we have to remove environmentally harmful subsidies. We all, in principle, agree. All the things which you mentioned, integration into common agricultural policy of the, for example, uh, you can imagine what was our internal fight for water cross compliance. And I would like to see it, how it will survive the Council. But we all agree, everybody here who was talking was saying integration into agricultural policy. Please do it. Actually, I have proposed it and I have pushed really hardly to propose it. Please do it. Because then you will complain again, as, as, you, as you have rightly said, we in member states cannot fix the things which were done on EU level, but unfortunately also on EU level many times member states are blocking that this would be done. And then it comes to you who, are, uh, who have to deliver it uh, on the member states level and you can't. And I fully understand that you can't. Or uh, Federico mentioned, for example, uh, increase in investment in horizon when it comes to water, which I fully agree. Do you know what is the orphan in the MFF negotiations? Heading 1A. Because there is no real interest in member states that we would push the growth and jobs which we are all fully supporting so fiercely. We have a lot of friends of agricultural policy. We have a lot of friends of cohesion policy. Is somebody putting on the first place growth, uh, the chapter 1A, when we talk about research and others? Not that I would know. But these are the real said that we need to bring a bit of fundamental honesty in policy making. And if we will pretend that we are doing it and uh, are not really doing it, sorry, we will meet in 2019 or any year later and discuss the same issues which we are discussing today. Because this fundamental honesty is unfortunately missing. Thanks. Well, we have reached the, the end of the, of the first session of the conference. I would like to thank the Commissioner, Mr. Gabeltov, for their presentations and the participants for their interventions. We will now proceed uh, with a coffee break, uh, but before leaving the room, some technical information from the Director of the Cyprus Water Director. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, before we break for coffee, I would like to make a number of short announcements. Please note that there is a slight change in the program. Uh, during the closing session tomorrow, the Cyprus presidency concluded remarks will be presented by Mrs. Egli Pandelakis, permanent secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture, Natural Resources and Environment of Cyprus. And a couple of information points on transportation, Please check out the list posted outside the conference room and note the time your bus will be departing for the airport tomorrow. If you have any questions or if you haven't provided your flight details, please contact the transportation information desk in the lobby. The participants who will be leaving tomorrow early afternoon, either for the airport or for Limassol to attend the water and marine directors meeting, are kindly requested to check out of their hotels in the morning, since the buses will, depart, will be departing straight from the conference center. There will be plenty of space to store your luggage in the clock room just opposite the conference room. The coffee break will take place now at Halko's restaurant located in the basement. We will resume at 11.15. Enjoy your break. Thank you.